to the truth and move on with her life. The Bill, here on ITV1 in half an hour. In this episode, we're here in Widnes and we're searching for the Vikings. But why Widnes? Why here for the Vikings? Widnes is a modern industrial town on the north bank of the River Mersey. But our adventure starts in the 8th century. At this time, Saxons ruled the land. That was until the arrival of Viking raiders. In the Victorian era, many of the finds coming off Widnes were attributed to the Vikings and those on the opposite bank coming off Runcorn to the Anglo-Saxons. And the reason for that is that the land came almost to meet at this point where the bridges are today. Hence it became Vidnes, the Wide Nose, named by the Saxons but based on the fact that the Vikings viewed the Mersey as a mighty serpent and this was its head. For over 300 years, Vikings stormed the world. The search for land, slaves, gold and silver took these brave warriors all across Europe. The speed and ferocity of Viking attacks became legendary. They were the most feared warriors ever to invade Britain. The earliest Viking attack was famously recorded at Lindisfarne on the east coast of Northumbria in 793 AD and shocked the Christian world. At first, they were just a few opportunistic pirate ships preying on the rich pickings offered by monasteries. In time, attacks intensified until scores of Viking ships came exploring the east coast, Scotland, Ireland and the west coast of Britain. The Vikings were lords of the oceans. Long ships carried them across wild seas into estuaries and along navigable rivers. Wherever they went, the Vikings had a significant impact. However, the existing Anglo-Saxons didn't give up without a fight. In the early 10th century, the Vikings were getting terribly restless. Around about 913, 914, 915 AD, Ethelfleet, Queen of Mercia, decided that she'd had enough. So she came up here to Runcorn, which was then known as Runcolan, and decided to build a burr, which is a small fort, to stop Vikings from pouring across the Vidnes, the Wide Nose, and infesting Mercian territory. Being King Alfred's daughter, Ethelfleda had a great military mind and realised this was an ideal defensive position to thwart Viking attacks. Sadly, it's not the impressive fort it once was. In the Victorian era, they decided that they needed the railway bridge behind me constructing to improve communications across the gap. But this started a disastrous process because the land on which Ethelfleet's burr was constructed was gradually truncated more and more till the only bit that was left was the burr itself. And then they put the support for the railway bridge right on top of it. As the years have gone by, more and more Viking objects have been found by metal detectorists on the north bank of the Mersey. And the research is also now helping to back that up, with more sites appearing on the Wirral and Lancashire. The biggest discovery of Viking treasure in Europe was found on the banks of the River Ribble near Preston. It's also one of the Northwest's best kept secrets. Two experts, bioscientist and Viking expert Steve Harding and county archaeologist Peter Isles, helped me to piece together the story of the Kerdale Horde. Could you tell us exactly what the Kerdale Horde is? Well, the Kerdale Horde is a large collection of silver. It's one of the biggest collections of silver ever found. It's dated to the very early years of the 10th century, about 905. But it contained a very large number of coins, a large number of silver ingots, and what we refer to as hack silver. That's jewellery, arm bracelets, that kind of thing, being cut up and used as effectively currency. 
In 1842, workmen repairing the riverbank found the hoard and dug it up in a frenzy of excitement. The Kerdale hoard was vast, numbering over 8,500 coins, jewellery and silver bullion. The hoard was buried in about 905 AD, the same time that Vikings had been driven out of Dublin. But who buried it and why? Stephen Harding has one explanation. Was this, uh, this treasure used for some sort of uh, war chest for, for paying armies of, uh, of Vikings? Uh, for the various campaigns that were going on in that in that period. So we're looking at a sort of central um, cache, if you like, of, of material wealth, which is then doled out to the different forces involved in coming into the, the north and, and taking over, very much like you say, as a sort of a war chest to pay off, to pay off the warriors. 40 kilograms of the stuff, yeah. So yeah. From the few thousand surviving pieces we have, the figure could be of as high as seven or 8,000 well, pieces. Seven or 8,000 coins. Points. Coins. And then on top of that, uh, a thousand or so pieces of uh, ingot or ingots themselves, and who knows how much jewellery. So in, in, right. in terms of a lost treasure then, this is something which, which is actually vast. It's an enormous amount of wealth for the Dark Age period, isn't it? And it's to some extent, it, it's just disappeared into the writings of history. The hoard would have a modern day value of over half a million pounds. Regrettably, the treasure was split between 41 British and foreign institutions and more than 170 individuals, many of whom are now unknown. Steve set off 20 miles up the M6 to investigate more evidence of Viking life in the northwest. We're here at Sir Wilfred's Church, Halton, North Lancashire, to see this wonderful piece of Viking stonework called the, the Halton Cross. Now, the Vikings love to tell a story with their stonework, and this particular story is about Sigurd the Volsung, Sigurd the Dragon Slayer from Norse mythology. One really interesting aspect of this stonework is it appears to combine Christianity on the one hand, this wonderful cross, with paganism on the other with the story of Sigurd the Volsung and suggests that this cross was erected uh, in the early part of the Viking settlements here, perhaps the first generation Christians, when they were still hankering on to the old beliefs from, from Norse mythology. The search for elusive evidence of Vikings eventually led us to a beautiful village which sits on a cliff overlooking Morecambe Bay. We're here at Hesham Head looking for the chapels of St. Patrick and St. Peter. And the great thing about these chapels is they're full of Anglo-Saxon carvings and the famous Viking hogback tombstone. But the best part of looking for lost treasures is when you arrive at a place that's like this, because it's magnificent. Hesham Head provides a stunning location for the 6th century Saxon chapel. A grave containing a Viking sword was discovered in the churchyard, but the most extraordinary feature of the site are grave slots cut into the solid rock. The Saxons and the Vikings are represented as almost together on this site, aren't they, through the burials? That's right, there are examples of uh, Saxon burials, uh, Viking burials, and uh, it does give the impression of, if you like, one integrated Anglo Scandinavian community rather than a separate Anglo community and a Scandinavian community. It's interesting that the famous rock cut tombs have what appear to be compartments for offerings which are the sort of things we've got here and at the same time they're aligned east-west which is the Christian burial custom. I personally find that, that quite a fascinating aspect of this although we're not really sure are we of what was in those compartments. Yeah and uh, these have been dated to about the 11th century uh, by which time uh, the Vikings would have been totally uh, Christianized. So it would perhaps be surprising if those indents there were, were places where they put uh, special values of, mm. uh, of treasure and things. So it's a bit difficult to speculate what they may have been for. All we can say is that whoever was buried here was obviously uh, people of, of, of some importance. It's more here a picture of cooperation between Saxon and Viking. That's right. Yeah, as, yeah. In, as indeed it was on the Wirral. Um, yes, and in fact, all of, along the, the northwest uh, coast, it was one of 
more of integration and cooperation. They're not always represented then realistically as, as the violent invader who rapes and pillages. They're actually the civilised settler who's travelled the world also by the same token. That's right, and then using violence when they, when they had to, but not unnecessarily. If these are Viking graves, it's very likely they had settled and adopted Christian ways. Most Christian graves approximately align to the rising and setting sun, but these are far more specific. Date-wise, we're almost on the solstice, so if they wanted to align the graves to the setting sun, you would expect it to face where the sun's going down at this moment in time. But what's really interesting is it doesn't. The graves actually align to magnetic west, which means the people who actually constructed these must have been aware of the location of magnetic north. And the best candidates, of course, for that are the Vikings with the lodestone compasses. They would have been perfectly capable of surveying and working out exactly where magnetic north was. So that's quite a revelation. That could help to support the fact that these are, in fact, Viking period graves. Less than 50 miles from Hesham Head on a relatively unprotected island, it was a completely different story. In 798 AD, the Viking menace swept onto the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea, about 50 miles off the coast of Western Britain, and started the story of this remarkable seafaring nation. At Peel, they burnt the monastery on St. Patrick's Isle to the ground, and all the earliest records of Manx history were lost. From this time, people constantly lived in fear for their lives. But eventually the Vikings settled on the island, bringing their ways and customs. They met to dispute matters and proclaim their laws at Tynwald, the Viking Parliament, the oldest parliament in the world, which still meets to this day on exactly the same spot. By marrying the local chieftain's daughters, the Vikings acquired all the land in Man and adopted Christian customs. This year, after an 18-year gap, the Isle of Man celebrated its unique history with a stunning Viking festival. Locals and visitors from around Britain were treated to reenactments of famous battles. It's been slightly interesting because, of course, this is a revival of an event that first happened back in 1961. So it's been fondly remembered in folklore, and just like the Viking sagas, everyone remembers these dramatic pageants on the beach. But this little island here controlled the Irish Sea and it's got 400 years of really important history. We're very proud of our uh, Viking uh, heritage. I think it's one of those events that whilst it is very spectacular while they're watching, it's uh, probably one of these things that uh, they will be thinking about for days and weeks to come. They've seen an awful lot of activity, an awful lot to take in, but that is the, the, the beauty of, of an event like this. You can live with the memories for quite some time. the events recreated was a magnificent Viking sea burial reserved for Viking chieftains. Vikings believed that when they died their god Odin called them to Valhalla, to the Hall of the Slain, to fight and drink again as warriors in the afterlife. Despite their fearsome reputation, Vikings are still a bit of a mystery. Driven by population growth, competition for farmland and ambitious leaders, Vikings colonised large parts of Britain, including the North West. They came to Wirral because they had permission from the then Queen of the English, Queen Ethelfled, to settle in these lands, which were then considered of low value, marshy land, which the English didn't really want. So the Queen of the English gave them permission to settle here on condition that they basically behave themselves and didn't start uh, attacking the, the surrounding English. During the Victorian era, storms and high tides battered the coastline. 
Between five and 8,000 objects from prehistoric through to medieval times were found on the beach, making Mells one of the most significant ancient sites in the northwest of England. Vikings have influenced hundreds of place names all over Lancashire and Merseyside. For example, Tranmere, which has the only football team in the English league with a Norwegian Viking name. Place names which end in Kirk, like Ormskirk, and B, such as Crosby or Kirby, also have strong Scandinavian influences. We're here in a suburban part of West Kirby at the Church of St Bridget's. What on earth has that got to do with the Vikings? Well, there's something very special inside. So mark the hot box just in the corner. Over in the far Over side there. of the church. Yeah. Oh gosh, you can just about make it out. Let's go and have a look. It wasn't there originally, of course. It was originally on the uh, side of a grave. Right. Somebody important. Wow, that's absolutely enormous. This looks to be in remarkably good condition. Six years ago, it was beautifully restored by the, the Merseyside Conservation Centre. And of course, it's not like it was originally. It's, it's suffered a lot of uh, erosion mm. uh, over the years. We think it was, uh, it was constructed somewhere in the region of uh, 1000 AD. These are quite important in that these are a hallmark of Viking settlement, aren't they? That's right. Someone remarked that the, the hogback is a monument to uh, Viking colonialism. So it's a very important status symbol. And the other interesting thing, of course, is when they, uh, they came over from, from Ireland, uh, many of them have become Christian. And it's possibly the biggest lost treasure we've found so far because it's in, in, in a modern environment here. We're in a, a relatively new church in a relatively modern housing estate here, aren't we? I noticed as we drove in, um, it's not the sort of place you would expect perhaps to find something like this. That's right, and of course many of the locals don't realise what sort of treasure they, 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 they have here. People don't even realise it's here. Uh, on their doorstep. Viking communities grew up in North Wirral and Saxons in the south appeared to tolerate their Scandinavian neighbours. That situation changed dramatically in the summer of 937 AD when a great Viking army from Dublin threatened the peace by pillaging English towns. The Wirral name of Thingwall, the site of the Viking Parliament or Thing, is possibly the place where the peaceful local Viking community discussed the coming onslaught. We're here on a hill overlooking Thingwall, the Viking Thing. What is a Viking Thing? Well, Mark, Thing is Old Norse for assembly or parliament. And across the road from here, this is, would you believe, one of the most significant historical sites on Wirral and possibly even the, the northwest because this is where the, the Wirral Norsemen had the uh, parliament. This thing would have uh, served the Scandinavian community on Wirral back in uh, the 10th century and possibly the 11th century. And it would have met uh, probably once, once a year, maybe twice a year to discuss policy, law and other things. The other big thing, big emergency, if it did occur on Wirral, would have been the, the Battle of Brunenburg when uh, an invading uh, Viking army coming from uh, Ireland with Scottish allies took on the uh, uh, English army led by King Athelstan and that certainly would have been of great concern to the locals. The Anglo-Saxon chronicles tell of one of the most ferocious battles ever fought on English soil at a place called Brunnenburg, possibly modern day Bromburg. Historians hotly debate exactly where it took place, but Stephen Harding and his team are convinced it was fought here. So at the moment this place looks very idyllic. It's got its pond with its willow and its mowed grass and its kept hedges. Why would this location be the battle site? Why here? This would seem to fit the bill more than others because uh, uh, Non-contemporary records now uh, record how the battle took place on some heathland uh, near some, some woods. This is actually from uh, Egil's saga. Right. And uh, historically, this is the area of heath. It's called Bevington Heath. 
and uh, on the far side there you've got uh, Storton Woods. And, uh, so if I was a, a gambling man choosing an area on Wirral where the battle would have taken place, this would have been uh, my choice. At the Battle of Brunnenburg, the fate of scores of Viking warriors was decided in a single day. Weapons expert Mike Lodes describes how the opposing forces squared up. The Saxon army of King Athelstan and the mostly Viking alliance of King Olaf were very similar type of troops. By the 10th century, the male Burney has become bigger. It's become what's known as the Hoburg, and it's got a male coif giving extra protection to the head. It's got the Aventail, which is this extra bit of mail here, either to give reinforcement to the chest or to be worn to protect the throat. Both armies are still fighting with shields, fighting in the shield wall, and they're using swords, and they're using spears. Whoa! There's a number of ways you can get through that. One way is they devised all sorts of tactics. They could do a thing called the Svinfilking, which is the boar snout. So you would get a wedge of men coming into a snout to punch right through and make a hole in the enemy lines. Or if they were outnumbered, you would get the forceps where they would try and encircle and outflank. But another way of doing it was to send out a blood squad with their great Dane axes. It's an extraordinarily versatile weapon that can be used with great fluidity. The Battle of Brunnenburg was fought relentlessly for nearly 10 miles across the Wirral. The killing fields flowed with blood from sunrise to sunset. Mounted Saxon warriors pursued the fleeing Viking forces and mercilessly felled them from behind as they tried to escape. It was carnage. So was that the end of Vikings on the Wirral? Well, probably not. Recent DNA analysis of 50 men from old Wirral families demonstrated that genetic links with Viking settlers. Today, that Viking influence still echoes in the Wirral landscape and its people. So the Vikings, in effect, are still here today? Absolutely, Mark. So watch out. <laughs>